right, well, we've got some hot temperatures around. Uh, yesterday I was going to, I was planning, well, about a week back, I was planning, all right, this weekend I'm going to get my kayak out and I'm going to go right around the, the coast of Lake Thunderbird. And then when Saturday came, I looked at the temperatures and I said, no, I'm not going to do that today. <laughs> and I got all kinds of reports about people getting heat stroke and all sorts of things going on yesterday. But uh, in the evenings, it's beautiful. So instead of doing a, a, a kayak around the place, just before the sun went down, Seppi and I took a walk out there. It was still pretty warm, but it was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. And there's a part there by the dam, if you look across the uh, lake, there's a, sort of like a little peninsula sort of thing that comes out into the lake. It looks like an island if you, don't, if you look at it from one perspective, but it's connected, of course. But around the outside of that, there's some beautiful spots for people to set up camp. And if you look across the lake, you see the fires going, the barbecues going, and they're, they're cooking up some meat and all sorts of stuff. Oh, man, beautiful. The smell mm, makes you hungry. <laughs> so it was good. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for today. Lord, we thank Thee for the grace of God. We thank Thee, Lord, for the founding of the country, Lord, and the tremendous price that was paid by those brave men and women who stood up for independence. And, Lord, we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, well, we're up to part 18. Part 18, and uh, we've, we've looked at all sorts of issues. Um, and we've seen how these things do overlap with various ideas which come up when we're discussing Acts 28. That is what happened um, uh, and when and what happened when the revelation of the mystery was given, what things changed. And one of the things that changed, of course, is our perspective on resurrection. Because a lot of things uh, Paul talked about in resurrection, the fact that there is an out-resurrection, and ex anastasis. Anastasis, the resurrection, and then ex, well, exit, out, the out resurrection, a very special resurrection from which rewards will be given. And Paul talks about this in Philippians, and it's, it's a fantastic thing. But the idea of resurrection goes back to Genesis. And so many of the doctrines do come back into uh, Genesis, and we, we have been beholding some of these things. We looked at Genesis 2-7 last time, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Now that's important, right? And over and over again in the scriptures, you'll find uh, various prophets saying, For we are but dust. For we are but dust. Going back to Genesis. And when you look at what we are, we are very organized dust. In terms of our body, if you look at the material that makes up our body, in our brain, all of this is organized matter. And that organization, in part and mostly, goes back to the chromosomes within our cells, which have all this information inlaid. And if you look at the, the chromosomes themselves, what are they? Well, they're just amino acids. And what are they? Dust. So what's happened is God has stamped on this dust a code, right? His code. And that code, the Word, has been put in there so that we are uniquely as we are today. Um, and when you look at, for example, when Paul talks about a resurrection, he talks about how that there are different types of bodies, some celestial and some terrestrial. He looks at the fact that there's not all the same flesh. There's a flesh of fish. And what's different with the flesh of fish and the flesh of man, for example? Well, it goes back to the information because they also are dust, right? They're just dust as well. What's fundamentally different between the fish and the animals and all these sorts of things is not the breath of life. Now, I used to believe that. I, I honestly did. I thought, well, man has the breath of life and all the other animals don't have the breath of life. But that's wrong. The animals have the breath of life also, which we discovered last time. 
They have the breath of life. So what is fundamentally different between us and the animals, fundamentally on, on, in terms of the creation? And by the way, I do not believe that we are fundamentally bipartite or tripartite. I think we are Unitarian in our makeup, that we are dust, organized dust. Now, there's things about us which are tripartite. There's the body, soul, and spirit. And the Word of God can discern between the soul and the spirit. That's how sharp it is. And if you're able to wield the sword, you can divide between soul and spirit. But it's pretty hard. It's pretty difficult to do that. But if you understand the Scriptures and you wield it and are used by the Scriptures, then you can discern between soul and spirit. So yes, there is certainly a body, soul, and spirit. But as far as our fundamental organization, going back to Genesis, we are dust. We are dust. And in that dust has been overlaid information. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. All things were made by Him. Him, the Word, the Logos. And that is the information. That is the one who drives everything in terms of information. That's the real difference between us and fish in terms of who we are organizationally. And God has put His image on us. And the image of God created He, man. And that image has fallen, yes. That's got to do with the tremendous organization he put into the flesh, which uh, was originally just dust. Okay, so, and it says here, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Notice it talks about the nostrils. Later on, you'll find this nostrils and the breath of life coming up again. Where is the breath of life? The nostrils, wherein is the breath of life? <laughs> Yeah, air breathers. So, you know, when you go back to the book of Genesis, it gives you a big insight into many things which you may have overlaid tradition. Now, traditions are not all bad. We can, we can build up traditions. We have a tradition of wearing ties. <laughs> we have that tradition. We have tradition of... Um, putting on clothes and different types of clothes, I should say. And that's fine. There's traditions which are quite good and helpful and useful. Paul had traditions, as ye, and he talks about the traditions which you have received of us. These are traditions which are good and proper. But there are also traditions which come from man's ideas which are in contradistinction to the teachings of the Scriptures rightly divided. And when we see that, we got to hammer it. Right, we got to hammer it. Okay, so there's some some really good things in here, and I've got here the breath of life. Okay, and I was talking about this. There are plenty of passages you can go to. Job is really an interesting one, but look at Genesis 7:22. It says, "All in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land." died. You see that? So it's very encompassing. All in whose nostrils is the breath of life. Well, you see, so that goes along with this idea that when the flood came, for example, then there's the, the possibility that fish, of course, would live, right? But it was only those on the land where there's the, the breathing uh, taking place, that they would be suffocated and would die, but those animals that were taking their oxygen out of water, well, they have the possibility of dying. But if we look at science, if we examine science, we'd say that there's probably a lot of turbidity and the mixing up of all sorts of sediment in the waters. It's very likely that a lot, not all, but a lot of the fish also would die. Very likely that would happen. And then we'd have a lot of deposits from that time of the flood uh, going into the various strata, uh, the alluvial type strata of this event, animals that died in the waters. Okay, so that's kind of interesting, right? Breath of life. Now comes an, another thing which relates to resurrection and death. 
So we, we understand something about this. And um, I would like you to, to just go across to 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to look at this word soon. This word, apolumi, apolumi, which means to perish. So in 1 Corinthians 15, um, it talks here a lot about um, the, the basis of the gospel that he was preaching. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. You see, these people received this, and they were standing on this basis, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Now, this idea of vanity comes up here. You can believe in vain, right? Someone can come to you with a message, and that message may have no basis in fact. Just a message that they dreamt up and they can come to you and give it to you and then you might believe it, right? But it's got no basis in fact. And, and it could be the reality is that the thing that you have believed in is a complete lie. It never happened. And people do this, especially with the, you know, the yabba dabba stuff going on behind the scenes, you know, busy bodies. There's a neat effigy if you go to... Uh, uh, OU, on the campus there, there's this effigy of these three ladies. They're murmuring, going together, you know, <laughs> and it's quite a neat little thing that's going on there. And so, all kinds of ideas can be promoted just from murmurings and ideas which don't have any basis in fact, but people might believe them, right? And when you believe it, you're believing in vain, in vanity. And this is going to move into the reality of Christ's resurrection. The reality of it. The truthfulness of it. That the gospel here, look what he says in verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. This is not a murmuring. This is not something which is in vain or empty. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He did this on the basis of fulfilling scriptures. It was not something which was uh, just something out of the blue. You know, Jesus Christ, he died on the cross at Calvary, and this is just a brand new idea. No, it's not a brand new idea. This is something that the prophets had talked about, and that it would happen. And this is a great thing for the Jews to see. I invite you to do this one day when you're uh, going through YouTube. There is a group who are Jew the Jews for Jesus. And what they do is, they go out into the streets of Jerusalem, and they will pull up various Jewish people. And they, they're fluent in Hebrew, right? They can speak fluently in Hebrew. And so in Hebrew, and they ask them very nicely. I mean, the interaction is with total respect, and it's beautifully done. And what they do is they just say, would you mind if I just read something from the Torah, you know, and also from the Tanakh? And they would say, oh, yeah, sure. And off they go, and they go through Isaiah 53 in Hebrew to them. And then they, after reading, and one guy with his camera has got a perspective on the person that's listening just to see their reaction. And then this is a kind of an honest interchange. They're reading from the Jewish scriptures and reading straight from their own literature directly to the Jew. And you can see th their face is, is sort of moving with shock because they have not actually heard this. <laughs> you know, they haven't heard this before. And then after the reading, some of them will complain. They say, well, that's, a, that, that's, not in the, that's not in our body. And then say, yes, it is. It, it is. Have a look. And then the next question is, who do you think this is? Yeah. Who hath believed our report? You know? Who do you think this is? And many of them will say, well, it, it sounds like Jesus. <laughs> it sounds like Jesus. And it, it's really amazing to see it. 
And you know, many Jews, they do not get to hear some of these very strong passages which prophesy about the death of Christ. It, they don't. They don't get to hear it. It's a remarkable thing. And it's a beautiful thing to see, really. It really brings uh, some warmth to your soul and sadness at the same time to think that these people who should, should actually own Jesus to be a real Jew, they should accept their Messiah, right? That's who Jesus came to. That Jesus came to his own, his own received him not, but he came to his own. You know? Anyway, so uh, let's keep on reading here. And it says in verse 4, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now here's an important thing. It's all according to the scriptures. And the other thing is that not every piece of good news relates to this. When Jesus would preach about the kingdom, uh, you would find in, in the earlier days when he was preaching about this, you find in the Gospel of Luke that the disciples did not know anything about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. They didn't know about this. This was not revealed to them at that time. Yet they were faithfully preaching the kingdom. And it goes on and it says, And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. Why is he saying this? Why is he saying, of whom the greater part remain unto this present? So this dates this, right? This, this definitely dates this record and tells you that you would be foolish not to consider the context of the Bible. And that's what we, as people who, who believe in rightly dividing the Scriptures, we want to major on. Because this, if we're going to say present means now, that's nonsense, right? If you say right division, the principle of right division doesn't matter, then you've got something that's stated right in front of you, which would be absolute nonsense if you're going to push it to today. It, where it says, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, and you make this present today. If you're going to make sense of this, you've got to say, well, this is dated. This makes sense back then. But it doesn't make sense to push that to now. And it says, but some are fallen asleep. Isn't that interesting how he says fallen asleep? We're talking about this idea of death and what it means. And it says, after that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as a one born out of due time. Yeah, well, there's lots of interesting doctrine about this. But I wanted to, to, to emphasize this idea of vanity and the gospel. That the gospel is not vanity because it's based upon the reality verified. It was verified by eyewitnesses, and that's what Paul is trying to point out to people. This stuff is not just made up by me. We've got eyewitnesses of whom the greater part remain to this present. Hey, you over there, did you see that? Yeah, I was there. Yeah, I saw it. I saw it. You see? Very strong witness to the reality of this. And then when you come down a little bit further, <clears throat> it says this um, in verse uh, 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? If Jesus came up from the dead, that's proof positive that there's a resurrection of the dead. If Christ came up, there is the possibility for people to come up from the dead. Oh man, what a faith we have. You can look at all the other religions. I'm not saying this to try and put them down as being stupid or anything like that, because they're not. A lot of people in different religions are not stupid. But they have not been given the reality and truth of this Christian message, which comes from truth. Eyewitness accounts that Jesus came up, and because he came up, we can come up. And yes, we will fall asleep one day. Yes, we will fall asleep, but we're going to awaken, man. 
And it says, verse 13, But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. So he's, he's cycling back. He's already established the fact that Jesus rose. If you say there's no resurrection of the dead, then you're saying Jesus didn't rise. But, well, wait a minute, we've got all this, these witnesses here that said he did. Yea, and we have found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, when he ra whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. You see, he's, he's going full cycle and showing that the only way you're going to get out of this is to say that we're all liars. We're all liars. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Verse 18, look at this. Then they also, look at it, which are fallen asleep in Christ, are perished. They're perished. So the only thing that stops us from perishing is resurrection. That's the only way out of this. Hey, the only way you're going to get out of perishing is to be resurrected. Now I've got some technical things here that might seem overly technical, but you see there is such a thing as a voice in Greek. And there is uh, this voice which is active, passive, and middle. Active is where, you know, I hit the ball, right? I am involved with this action, and I did some action on an object. Passive is I was hit by the ball. I was hit by the ball. Subject takes the action from something else. I was hit by the ball. But then in Greek, there is something called a middle. A middle. Where the subject is in some way involved with this. And where it might be in some cases that the subject benefits from the action. Or it might be that the subject is put in some disadvantage by the action, but where the subject in some unique way is affected by the action. And this is the middle. Now the middle, when, it, when the verb is put into the middle, it's seen mostly as in the same form as the passive. But there are two tenses when you can distinguish absolutely the middle, and that is the aorist and the future. So what I did was, I went through the Bible using my program. I was going to show you how I did this, which is really cool. <laughs> it's a cool thing, man. My program is cool. Where I can find the various parts of speech and search on them and get what I want, which I could never get myself without spending my whole life going through all this but I'll get it like that. And so here what we have is this verb, apolumi. And it's where it's used in the aorist and future middle. And here they are. And we could look at them all. But you'll notice that here just there's John 3, 15 to 16. Isn't that interesting? That's where it it comes up. It comes up in other places as well. For example, in John 11, right? That's there, and also in John 6, which we can look at. But let's just have a look at this now, okay? Let's just go back to John, and we've seen it before, I know. But let's just have a look at it, see what we can get out of it. So this is John chapter 3. Okay, and this is a famous passage. I, I know, I know this is famous. This is something that um, Billy Graham has uh, been uh, really good at uh, bringing out in his messages. John three, 
verse 14 we'll read from. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, remember we read this from Numbers 21, just before the service. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Look and live, you see. That whoso believeth in him, this is verse 15, should not perish. Now we read in 1 Corinthians 15 that if Jesus be not raised, then we're perished. But have eternal life. We get eternal life in contradistinction to perishing. You perish or you have eternal life. Verse 16. For God so loved the world. The world. Well, maybe Calvin is right. The world of the elect. <laughs> the world of the elect. That he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, here in John 3, 15 and 16, you've now got a double up on this idea of the contradistinction between perishing and everlasting life. You're either going to perish... Or you're going to have everlasting life. And it goes on. And it says in, in verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world. To condemn the world. But the world through him. Might be saved. Might be saved. Well there's a. The possibility that not everyone would be saved because they may not believe. They may not trust on him. Verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's why they're condemned already, because they did not believe. Now, look at this passage. This is from First uh, Timothy, uh, chapter two, and verse four. But we'll read a little bit before then. This is First Timothy. This is by Paul, chapter two, verse one. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For all men. For kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Well, that's what we want, is a peaceable life. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Who, who is this? God our Savior. Who will have all men to be saved. And to come unto the knowledge of of the truth for there is one God and one mediator between God and men the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time whereunto where I am ordained a preacher and an apostle I speak the truth in Christ and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity so there's a, a very strong teaching in here that potentially all could be saved the only problem is that because we have this choice in us we can either say yay or nay now okay let me just diverge a little bit what has this perishing and all this got to do with this idea that all could be saved and the doctrine of the possibility of all being saved well one uh, one of the big problems you have those that believe in the free will choice of men is that people who don't like the f that idea of the free will will say, well, you see, what you believe in is that God, knowing all things that would happen and knowing all the free will choices that men and women would make, still made the world and still did it. He made, knowing that all these millions of people would say no to Christ. And therefore he knew 
Now here it comes. Here it comes. He knew that all these people would burn in hell forever, right? Now, wait. Wait. What if that's wrong? What if your understanding of hell is completely a tradition of men? What if? Just saying what if. And instead we put in there perish, which is to be destroyed. Then, that changes things, right? Because then your objection would be, well, God knew that all these people would not accept the Lord Jesus as Savior and therefore would perish. Yeah, but perishing does not mean being in pain forever, right? That perishing would mean being destroyed, goes out of existence. That means the opposite of eternal life. Then I would say that objection drops to the ground, largely, right? That objection drops to the ground. Now turn it around the other way. What if you take a Calvinistic view, right? The Calvinistic view says that, yes, you have, you have the ability to choose, but you can only choose based upon your strongest desire, which comes from your will, which was made and put in place deterministically by God. Right? It's called compatibilism. This is how the Calvinist can say you have a free choice. Because you make your choice on the basis of your strongest desire, and that comes from your will, which was designed to be that way. Okay, so let's take the Calvinistic's view then. Then the Calvinist must say that God designed, He designed all of these people to go to hell. Right? Hell. He designed it that way. They, didn't have, they did not have the free will choice based upon a libertarian choice, but rather it was deterministically done. Now when someone does something bad, but it's determined that they did so not because of their own choice, but because they were put into a corner and had to do it, what do we do in our courts? Do we give them a more severe judgment or a less judgment? We give them a less judgment, don't we? When someone can say, yeah, but I had no choice. I had no choice. I could do no other than what I did. What, if, if as a jurist you understood the argument and you could see that this person is telling the truth, that's right, they could do no other. Then what would you do? Would you give them some severe judgment? No, you wouldn't. You would lessen it. Whatever it would be, it would be less. So what I'm saying to you is this, this doctrine does actually, this doctrine of perishing does actually impringe on a whole lot of different things which are quite important to get sorted out. Now, I was going to go into John chapter 6 to show you another parallel with perishing because it's really cool. But I'll finish with this one and then we'll finish up today. This is in 1 Corinthians 15 again. Let's just go there. So 1 Corinthians 15, great passage. Um, this talks about the second coming. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Oh, okay, so are we corruptible? Yes, we are corruptible. The only time we're going to become incorruptible is through the resurrection. You either perish or you have everlasting life. The way you get everlasting life is through the resurrection. Whatever resurrection it may be. In this case, it's the second coming. And it says, For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Oh, man, the change, you see. Job talks about this. He shall await till his change come. And it says, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal 
must put on immortality. The only way you're going to get immortality is if you put it on. And that putting on is at the resurrection. Otherwise, you're mortal. And when you die, you would have perished except for this. Except this resurrection occur, you perished. Gonzo, man. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality... Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. So when is death swallowed up in victory? When? At the resurrection. At the resurrection. That's the only time and place when death is swallowed up in victory. And it says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's who gives us the victory. Because we have the resurrection coming to us. We shall put on immortality. Cool, man. It's a rock and roll. And all these things mesh. They mesh with other doctrines. Those people who want to lay objection to free will choice by saying, God could see your choices, yet he still made the earth, he still made people knowing that they would burn forever in hell. Yeah, but wait a minute, what if you got that wrong? What if your hell doctrine is all up the pole? Then your argument falls to the ground. Right? Cool. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank thee for today, Lord, for the 4th of July, Lord. And all that it means to us, Lord, we think of the deeper significance that men and women stood by the truth and many times against their friends and relatives. And they had to stand up for the truth and fight for the truth for fear of death, Lord. We thank thee, Lord, for their courage. We pray, Lord, that we would emulate that in our lives. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.